there's this endless gap, right, between education and practice. It doesn't only happen in architecture. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. Today I will be speaking with Tyler Sumala, a serial learner obsessed with helping architects optimize all things business development, sales, marketing and operations. Before transitioning into business development at Monograph, Tyler worked in both large and small architecture offices and also ran his own architectural design studio for two and a half years. He holds a BS in architecture from the University of Michigan and an MArch from Princeton University. Tyler is currently creating a community of architects at tylertactics.com where he sends one quick and powerful tactic each week to help architects communicate their unique value. It was an absolute pleasure and a joy to sit down with Tyler. Definitely on the same page here with lots of the things that we were talking about in terms of um, how a practice can expand their business pipeline and the strategy and negotiation uh, that can be utilized for increasing fees. And Tyler also discusses some of the tools and infrastructure every firm owner should have if they are really serious about growing their business pipeline. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Tyler Sumala. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Tyler, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm doing well, Ryan. How are you doing? I'm very good. An absolute pleasure to be speaking with you. You are the, you, you, you've got a background in architecture. You've worked for Monograph in their business development team. Um, you're the author, founder of TylerTactics.com, which is, how would you describe this? And I must make the distinction when I was when I was looking earlier. It's different from TylerTactical.com. I don't know if you've come across that website. I did not know that was a website that existed. So uh, that's ty- pretty funny. TylerTactical.com is gun training. Oh no! So, don't go there. <laughs> don't go there. No, I would be able to offer no help in that department. <laughs> Oh, no. Um, no, Tyler Tactics um, is a community of architects that I'm building. Um, it's currently just a newsletter that I'm housing there at the moment that I'm sending out once a week every Sunday morning. But it's really focused on helping architects attract high mm-hmm. quality clients, um, better communicate their value, um, things like that. Got it. Great. Um, so you're trained as an architect. You have worked at SOM. For a, mm. for a period of time. Mm-hmm. I know that you uh, you got your master's from Princeton. True, yes. So it's a it, you've got a you've got a a, a fine <laughs> architectural pedigree here, but we find you in a different context perhaps um as a as an expert, as a consultant, as somebody who's kind of helping architects unlock the potential or the latent potential inside of their businesses. Yeah. Um how did this career divergence happen? Uh, that's a great question. Um, most, the short answer is mostly from a lack of fulfillment within the industry that I was feeling. Um, right. The longer answer of that was kind of ex- trying to explore different opportunities, you know, within within the industry. So right out of right after grad school, at least I worked at SOM, um, which is an extremely like you know. They have very talented people there. I felt like I learned so much in that time period. Um, mm-hmm. But in terms of the work-life balance, I wasn't as um, keen on it, uh, which is, you know, a challenge <laughs> universally across across the industry. Um, however, uh, so I decided to move from that into running my own small studio in, in my hometown uh, back in Michigan at the time. And so I enjoyed doing that for a little while, but about two and a half years into it, it was kind of just... I was just feeling run down about it. Like I, I wasn't feeling super fulfilled on it. It was a little bit challenging in a small town to really grow that into something different. And my wife and I had specific goals around our lifestyle. You know, we wanted to be location independent. 
um, we wanted to be able to work remotely and work where and when we wanted to. And I realized, well, <laughs> can't really do that um, while running while running my own studio. So mm -hmm. that was the impetus to kind of begin looking at different opportunities in and around the industry and different ways of using my experience in architecture. So Monograph turned out to be the perfect fit um, for people that don't know. That's just a project management kind of practice operations platform built specifically for architects. And we, there's about 700 plus architecture firms that are using it. So basically on a daily basis on the business development side, I get to have endless conversations with architects about you know the challenges that they're facing in their practice. And I think I've really, uh, I think I really underestimated the impact that that would just have on me and in my understanding and my pulse that I have on the industry. I've had about um, 1,000 plus conversations with architects in the past year. So mm -hmm. I just feel really good about having an understanding of what the challenges are that most of them are facing. And what are, what are some of the, if you were to kind of start identifying, you know, pertinent trends from all those conversations, what would you, what would you put in your top three Mm. Top three travesties that affect architecture Top practices. three travesties. <laughs> they kind of all group into one. So on, on the practice operations side, what I, would, what I would kind of categorize it all under is this umbrella that most firms are in a reactive state rather than mm -hmm. a proactive state. Um, so that means that they are most often... Um, they're reacting to things after they've already happened. And, and by things, I mean like a project going over budget, people working too many hours, um, <clears throat> realizing that a lot of the team is working overtime. They're generally realizing this after the project is over, usually at the end of the month or even at the end of phases when they're going to do the invoice. So they're not getting that real-time attention so that they can actually catch these things before they happen. Um, yeah. so that's, that's the most common cause. And then, you know, because architects are so busy, it kind of just laps back on it, laps back on itself in the sense that, oh, they're reactive. They have this realization, this project went over budget. Um, I hope that we don't do that again. Let's try to stop that from happening. But then mm -hmm. they don't have the ability. They might not have the data or they might not have the time to go back and analyze why that happened. Why did it go over budget? Um, you know, was it a specific employee that worked too many hours? Was it a specific phase that we spent too much time on? So that means that we're just generally not learning from our own mistakes, right? We're, we're making the same mistake over and over again, and we're unable to analyze it in a reasonable way to make sure that we're actually improving and growing the business. Mm -hmm. Th that's very interesting you know there's this kind of idea of reactive versus proactive type of model of of an architecture business and uh, i think Liam, most most businesses are in this kind of reactive state and you know there's a certain degree of you know of growth that can happen from being reactive it's not maybe the desired right. kind of growth that you want and we certainly see plenty of businesses that operate with the dictum of just do good work or just do the work and then the work will come to you. And so we see reactivity not only in just project management, but also in their marketing. Would you agree with that? Or is that something you've seen as well? That there's a kind of there's reactivity, you know, both in the business, on the business, with winning work. Yeah, I mean I think it's even Maybe even less so. I mean, on the on the project management side, it's very it's generally very reactive, just because there's always projects coming in, there's always work to be done. On the business mm -hmm. development side, it's less reactive because most of the time, um, that's not an area of focus for firms, right? So it's reactive in the sense that there might be in inbound opportunities coming in, you know, from a website or from a referral sure. or something like that that they're excuse me, then they're that they're then reacting to. And they're not exactly sure how to take on um, mm -hmm. versus being proactive and actually doing maybe some outbound outreach, trying to build that sales pipeline um, or even having any kind of tracker. And, you know, are you tracking your pipeline in any way, shape or form, whether that's on an Excel spreadsheet or or, you know, using HubSpot or something, you know, using a kind of CRM. So, yeah, mm -hmm. in that way, I've definitely found it's it's very uncommon for firms to really have a developed business development cycle in some way yeah no this is this is not not uncommon and you know there's plenty of companies that we see that are purely 
grown from organic reactive types of marketing do one project another one comes along finish that one another one comes along what are some of the issues that you see with growing a practice like that uh the primary issues are usually you know it's one is just not having the ability to learn from your own mistakes Mm -hmm. right because it's you it kind of forces you to be in a in a memory mode where you can only your only version of learning from your mistakes is remembering what you did wrong the first time or what you think you did wrong the first time right mm -hmm. um so without having any kind of data any kind of track record for you to go back and analyze and understand what you're doing wrong it makes it really difficult to grow um mm -hmm. the other impact that that has is just the pace of growth or maybe even the you could even say the flexibility and the direction of that growth. If you have if you have a really strong understanding and you're able to track and measure all of these different metrics because it's mm -hmm. there in front of you, then you really can steer the ship. You have the ability. Do we want to grow right now? Do we want to take on larger projects? Should we go explore another market? Um, and you have the information that you need to make an informed decision with that. Without that information, I you know it's kind of like you're just blowing with the wind in terms of mm -hmm. you know what what's what's the best thing to do here? Well, it seems like maybe this is the best thing to do because they're coming to us for a project. And I guess we can hire on a few more people um, so that we can take it on. So what would be your advice then to a practice that's looking to expand their pipeline? How would they begin? You know, what, what, what would be the, some of the first steps that they would be needing to take in order to develop and mature a pipeline? Yeah. The first thing I think is just to understand the, and, and perhaps actually just to take a step back yeah perhaps you could define what a pipeline is because sometimes when you we use this word and I'll, I'll often say it to people in my you know we've all got different definitions of what pipeline <laughs> is. yeah that's true i so to me a pipeline is almost like a backlog of potential it's a backlog of potential work for you and your firm it's a plan it's a calendar it's it's this built up potential of possible clients of of potential projects that you can be pursuing and that you can kind of be nurturing along in the mm -hmm. hopes that they will eventually become a, a you know work at your firm. Okay. So this is this is prospective work. It's not committed work. In my opinion, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all yeah, it's all perspective I, I, work. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Like sometimes yeah. sometimes we use the word pipeline and people are talking about work that they've already got committed and they've got <laughs> yeah. an agreement on. I'm like, nah. No, that's no. committed work. Let's yeah. talk about the, the pipeline. is a, It's a sales, it's a sales funnel. It's mm -hmm. prospective clients. Okay, exactly. And, 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 and how would you? What kind of criteria would you um, permit a project to enter the pipeline, if you like? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even start at the project level, which is maybe the challenge that most architects have. Right? They don't consider that pipeline to begin until maybe they have the idea of what a project could be right mm -hmm. so that to me would be there's a difference between inbound um, pipeline and outbound pipeline inbound being those projects that are coming to you might not really have to um, that's like projects that are coming in as a result of marketing for example or as a result of people visiting your website or as a result of a client recommending you in some way it's work yep. you know it's it's not so actionable Outbound mm -hmm. is a lot more actionable. That's you getting on the phone, you're calling potential businesses that you think might be a good client. You might be reaching out to um, builders that are doing you know, the type of work that, that your firm does to develop new relationships. So it's a, it's a lot more active. So understanding that most firms are really only doing inbound usually. Um, yes. okay. Outbound is one massive way to really expand that. Um, right. Okay. So, so the out the, the outbound one is much more the kind of proactive part of this pipeline. Yeah. If you the 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 outbound one is the one if you want to actually take control of your pipeline rather than kind of waiting back a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's one way to do it, and it's also a really great way to get an understanding of your ICP of your ideal um, client. I forget what the P stands for, persona or something. Um, Got it. <laughs> um, but basically, so ideal, to get an, ideal client persona. That's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. To get an idea of your ideal client, right? Because usually in that process, you're going to be having lots of conversations with your ideal client, whether or not they're ready to take on, you know, whether whether or not they um, are ready to do a project in some way, shape, or form. You're at least having the conversations to begin to understand, you know, what's going on in their decision making process. Why aren't things moving forward now? 
um, what type of projects are they willing to do? What are the budgets for those projects? So you you do get a better understanding of your market in that way. On the inbound yeah. side, at least if we're including like marketing, there's obviously you know a significant amount of things that you can do to increase conversion rates. That's really what what that's all about. You know, what can you do to increase conversion rates on your website, which would be you know make it really easy for someone to book a meeting with you, for example, and really mm-hmm. just focus in and hone in on that CTA or just be very clear about what the challenges uh, are of the people that generally come to you and how you're able to resolve those challenges. So that's like, you know, copywriting and things like that that you can do on the website side. So expanding and building the the pipeline, first of all, there's this kind of distinction between inbound and, and, and outbound and recognizing that there's organic and, you know, reactive growth and proactive growth and mm-hmm. just making a concerted effort to, to, you know, start growing the pipeline is, is, is actually a, a deceptively simple, but effective strategy. Yeah. Um, yeah. What would what would come next? What kind of activities do you recommend or help architects develop in terms of okay, what well, what what now? What where do we go? How do we start filling up the pipeline with you know where do we start? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first thing is just to develop some kind of tracking system, right? So that could be that could be a spreadsheet of some kind. You could build something like that in Notion. You could use a CRM like HubSpot to be able to track this pipeline in some way. Mm -hmm. And the pipeline is going to be made up of a pipeline of leads, which are contacts or businesses or accounts that you're trying to create, that you're trying to convert into an opportunity, which is the other type of, um, which is the other type of pipeline, right? And an opportunity being someone that has expressed interest, you're meeting with them, you're asking them questions. There, There is a project you know that's going to emerge and they're going to have to make a decision of who they want to work with got it okay so so basically it kind of moves so we've got leads which are kind of anything from a conversation of a potential prospective Mm -hmm. client but there might not be a site involved there might not be a specific project it becomes an opportunity when you can smell money shall we say (laughs) right when there's actually something there uh right that they're that they're going to be doing and so within that it's it's really Yeah, there's a, yeah, exactly. It's really a funnel, right? So the top of the funnel is a lead that's just a new lead. You've identified that that's someone that's that could be an ideal client for you. You're not. Mm-hmm. You might, if it's outbound, you might not be sure if they actually have if there's any work to be done. But you just know that that's a, usually the type of either person or the type of business um, that we work with on a, on a regular basis. So right then, then if you're working that lead which is another kind of category you're moving a little bit closer down you're working them you're reaching out to them that's either through calling them or sending them an email trying to develop a relationship with them in some way to understand Mm -hmm. whether or not they have work Um, and then obviously the goal with those conversations is eventually to convert them into that opportunity and so once it's an opportunity right there's another then that's another phase of like is this, are we at the beginning, like the, the discovery phase to understand what is this project? What are the challenges? Why, why, why do they need an architect? Um, mm-hmm. And how can we help overcome? Are they a good fit for the type of work that we do? And then is it a proposal phase where you're now developing the proposal or the negotiation phase? So let, let's say that we've, we're an architecture firm and we've identified a number of kind of potential leads. We know we've, we've kind of gone through the local yellow pages because that's obviously mm-hmm. what people still have these days. And <laughs> identified like a whole load of sort of, you know, local developers. And we know, mm-hmm. you know these are the guys that we want to talk to. How do we turn that into, how do we get this name or an address or a phone number into like a potential opportunity what 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 do you say how do you mm-hmm. start the conversation it's like kind of like it's kind of a little bit like dating and like everyone wants to know what what what, the, what are the pickup lines? yeah what do you do yeah it, this is typically there's this this is a this is a freeze point right this is like a bottleneck mm. that that architects hit where they're afraid you know to pick up the phone and call someone um out of fear that they might not know exactly what to say or how to develop a relationship but the thing is you don't usually have you don't have to overthink it right so Mm -hmm. especially if you're maybe you're a new firm or you've been there for a while you're picking up the phone to call a developer just to say hey this is tyler sumula from abc firm i've seen your work around town it seems like really similar to a lot of the work um that we design i'm I'm curious um if i can just ask you a question 
and 95% of the time they're going to say yes. And you say, well, you know, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, the relationship that you have with your current architects, for example, right? And you're just going to get an understanding of how do they work with architects today? Um, maybe they're not happy with the architects that they're using. Um, maybe they haven't thought about developing like strong relationships with architects. You're just trying to understand what the challenges are that they're facing the, so that you can say, Got it. Oh, hey, I understand, you know, you've had these, uh, it seems like it's a common issue that your projects are going over budget. You know, that's actually something that, that we're really great at. 95% of our projects come in under budget. How about we, how about I swing over to your office sometime next week and we can kind of talk about what that relationship would look like. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So, so basically you're kind of get, go, jumping on the phone or jumping in some form of communication and getting interested, interested in what their challenges are, what their business agendas are, what, you know, what's been happening, their problems, their pain points, and starting a conversation around that. Yeah. And, and Ryan, it's true of, that's true of whether or not you're talking, you're, you're trying to develop a new relationship. And that's also very true of after an opportunity has begun. Um, right. a, a very common mistake that, that we make as architects, right, is that someone comes in and then we begin immediately pitching them our firm and mm -hmm. our solutions and all of the amazing things that we've done. and that shouldn't happen. I mean, that should almost never happen. Maybe at mm -hmm. maybe at the end of the conversation, but all up front, everything. If you're reaching out to someone, if someone's coming to you, it should be 95% about them trying mm -hmm. to understand, you know, who they are, what they like, what their challenges are, why they need an architect, and then the last five percent might be something like, well, great, you know, that's something that we're really good at, <laughs> you know. So, so you wouldn't recommend the kind of classic dog and pony show type of performance or the I portfolio? The not, kind if you of, want a high, not if you want a high win rate, I wouldn't do it, no. <laughs> got it, got it. Okay, well, this, this is very interesting. So this is obviously the kind of way that we've been trained as architects is, you know, through a portfolio, dazzle them with the work. I mean, the worst case scenario, this is kind of what leads us to – giving be giving away free work because we're trying to we're trying to impress right um like so so how do we how do we kind of reel that one back in because this is this is quite tough you know i've spoken to architects in the past and um you know they 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 want to they want to they want to do the presentation they want to do the pitch they want to do the the glossy images they're already they've already designed something on the site and we're only in a conversation <laughs> yeah it's tough it's it's one of these things where you really have to understand your client to provide them the most value, right? So that's that's really what it comes down to. So there's almost two components to that. One is developing a strong relationship with that client, with a prospective client, let's say, with the, with the prospect. You want to develop a strong relationship with them. So the second part of that is usually just having a really good understanding of their challenges and their pains. And you can and you might say, Tyler what pains they just they just want a new home designed you know to which i would say well what's wrong with their existing house mm -hmm. you know why why do they need a new one and then they might say well it's too small okay well what's too small about it where where is it small is it the kitchen that's small is it that you um you're all like kind of on top of each other is it that the bedrooms are too close to one another like what's the challenge so really getting an understanding of what that initial challenge is and then the next part of that is going deeper. Hey, what what impact does that have on the client that you're talking to, right? So if they might say something like, the house is too small. Okay, well, how does that impact your day-to-day -day activities? And they'll say, well, you know, I'm I'm all over my kids when they're when they're in the house. I feel like I don't have any private space. Okay, and then it's like, well, what would that look like if you didn't have, if the space wasn't too small for you? What does that solution look like to you? What impact would that have on your life? So then you're getting an understanding of, oh, well, I'd be able to have my own space. Um, I'd feel a lot more comfortable. I'd feel a lot more at peace. So then you're really understanding the challenge all the way through. You got the surface level challenge. You understand how it's impacting their day to day. And then you understand really the outcome that they're looking for. Hey, they're looking for just the opportunity to have some peace, to have some of their own space to themselves. And that's mm -hmm. like the key that you have now working all the way through the rest of that sales pipeline. Right. So you then have to position your firm and your solution. You are you are the vehicle that gets them from point A where they're at right now, tight space, all of these challenges, everyone's on top of each other, to mm -hmm. point B, which is peace, freedom, relaxation. Yep. 
Got it. Okay, so you're kind of creating this tension, if you like, between a sort of helping them articulate where they are right now and actually getting them present to perhaps what are the um, real motivators behind the project. And this might be something they haven't actually explained or articulated before and then helping them create like what the desired outcome is. And so there's a bit of a, a bit of a tension between the two and you're yeah. the bridge, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really that first conversation is, is should be a little bit more like a therapy session, right? It should be it, exactly what you said, they might not have even expressed these or have even had these realizations yet. I mean, why? Because the the issue is if you don't dive deeper into what is what the true motivations are, what they're actually looking to do, then you're going to run through this entire process and get to the end when you're writing the proposal and you've put it all together and mm -hmm. you're going to start hearing objections. It's like, well, you know, I'm not sure if now is the right time to do it. Um, I'm not sure if we should be moving forward right now. That pr that price seems a little bit high. Um, that fee seems high. And if that happens and you haven't done a good discovery process, you haven't really built a relationship with that person, it's mm -hmm. really difficult to overcome those objections because you don't know what their true motivations are. Yeah. You know, if they I'm come to you and if you've, if you've done a strong discovery and they come to you and, and say, you know, I'm not sure if now's the right time, then it's like, oh, well, it seems like you're a bit hesitant. I know that you're really focused on, you know, getting that peace and freedom, what's what's changed since we last spoke. You know, you have something to fall back on so that you know, you really know what their what their driving force is. Got it. Got it. Okay. So so it's 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 actually kind of really, you know, you're trying to go under the covers a little bit here and 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 get something a little bit more intimate from them. Or having I think them so, feel yeah. Comfortable. Yeah, you wanna you you wanna be able to get that conversation to a place, yeah, where you're you're both, you know, you're both a little vulnerable and mm -hmm. expressing the challenges that you're facing. You know, it has to be, excuse me, it has to be two sided in that way. Mm -hmm. But doing that, it develops such a strong relationship and it's a very different way of, of moving forward, right? You're really, really focused completely on the client. You're not so much thinking about all of the things that you can do or even about the design. You really just want to get an understanding of who they are, what they're doing, what their challenges are so that if you so one to make sure that you are the right fit for the client obviously um but two so that you can better express that value to the client that value that you can bring yeah so what happens then in projects where we don't have the ability to communicate in this kind of really personable um intimate therapeutic type of way so if we're looking at perhaps more commercial work or institutional work is probably a good example where people are responding to rfqs or we have that kind of you know i mean a lot of these a lot of these publicly tended works you know they've had a legal team a finance team they've worked out what the budget is going to be and mr architect you've got to fit your stuff into here oh and by the way you can't approach anybody directly because if you do then you're in breach of whatever the competition rules are mm -hmm. what, 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 what would you suggest about you know because this this is almost like the client's way or the client's system for not for not buying or yeah. for not contracting and they're really just sort of you know it's it's, it's one of the sort of real problems in modern contemporary procurement right around the world yeah how do we how do we get around this um i, I wish i had a solution for that right <laughs> i i i hate rfps and rfqs for that reason i don't i wish that there was a way to just say architects are not going to engage with them in any way because i really think it's led to the devaluation of the industry like hugely you know you force you force um you remove the ability for people to build relationships with people to really understand what the challenges are. And then mm -hmm. you basically just make firms compete on price, um, which is, it's just, it's just the commoditization of the industry and it's, it's the bad direction in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm with you on this one. I, I think in, in general, you know, if you're responding to an RFQ or going into a comp competition, you know, go with it with your eyes wide open mm -hmm. and, you know, many times I've spoken to a CEO of a practice and they'll say, well, we won't enter into any kind of RFQ or competition unless we've known about it six months prior and that we've had right. some sort of, again, what you're talking about is they've been developing that sort of relationship prior to whatever public tendering process they need to have, right. which is, again, is another level of proact proactivity. Right. Yeah. So if you're doing, if you're doing the right 
outbound before this, then you might already have the relationships built with these people and you probably heard about it beforehand. So yeah, that'd be, that would be a way around it in, in some way, shape or form, you know, as, mm-hmm. as knowing that it's kind of coming um, before it actually comes. Um, yeah. But outside of that, I mean, there's not a whole lot you can do from a relationship building standpoint, or even from, in my opinion, from like a, you know, leverage standpoint to make your firm stand, other than, I don't mm. know, put together a really great proposal. But, <laughs> you know, it's it's just, it's a little bit of a race to the bottom. It's yeah, more of a race sure. to the bottom for sure. Sure. So, so let's let's go back to the the kind of example you were working us through in terms of you you're having this um, discovery conversation with a prospective client. You're understanding the underlying uh, emotions and drivers for a project. Um, you're helping them articulate and discover what the real problems are and why the project is so important. How do we kind of capture all of this into a killer proposal? Yeah. What does a what does a proposal look like? Should we be still be using them? Are they obsolete? Can we do this face to face? What 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 would you suggest? I think the proposals are something that I'm that I'm that I've only recently started to dive a little bit into to understand what that process looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, because it does seem to be different for every firm. Although in general, you know, there's a little bit of a templatized version of doing this proposal that that the vast majority of firms are doing, right? There's an introduction of, there's that letter up at the front that says, hey, you know, we're so excited for to be considered for this project. You know, there's a walkthrough of projects that are similar to the ones that they're proposing for. There's the CVs of everyone on the team that's going to be working on the project. And mm-hmm. then there's this kind of hopeful statement at the end that's, you know, I, you know, I hope that uh, I hope that you'll consider working with us. It's all very soft, right? It's, yes. it's a, you know, I, I'm, I'm very ne- hopeful. Ne- needy almost. Yeah, it's needy. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is how amazing we are. I hope that you notice it. Um, I hope this is enough for us to stand out, right? So what's nice is that after you've done that discovery process, I don't think it's bad to, I don't think it's bad to do a proposal. I mean, you should definitely do one, but mm-hmm. you now understand and can focus in um, on making sure that you're basically returning every single point back to those challenges and back to those primary motivators um, that your client has kind of dispelled to you, right? So one rule of the proposal is that you never send it in an email, never send it via mail, that no matter what, whether that's on uh, webcam like we are right now on a video chat, or whether that's in person, that you are sitting down and, and walking them through this proposal. Yes. Um, before before they've ever seen it by themselves because you want to be there to reinforce everything um, that they've already told you to reinforce the fact that you completely and utterly and at multiple levels that they don't even realize understand their challenges and are able to offer the exact value that they need. Yes, 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 and yes, and yes. This is music to my ears. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, what, what, perhaps talk us through that a little bit more about the, the importance of doing it face to face versus the, the vulnerabilities of just sending it out as an email, yeah. which is what 99% of people do. Well, think, think about it from the state of your client, right? So put yourself in your client who's no matter, I mean, let's just say it's a residential project, for example. Um, your client's putting a lot on the table, by reaching out to an architect, by doing an architectural search, by deciding that they're going to build a new home, there's this is most likely a new process for them, right? They haven't mm-hmm. they haven't ever gone through this process, maybe not at this scale at least. Um, they don't know what the process looks like. They don't know what they're looking for. I mean, you really are a teacher and an educator as an architect. We it's easy to forget that, right? Because we're always working with with clients, but the vast mm-hmm. majority of the time, these clients probably haven't experienced you know, working with an architect before, um, depending on the type of work that you do. So you have to put yourself in their shoes and understand they might like they might not know what to expect from a proposal. Like if you send them things, they don't actually know what they're supposed to focus on. They're probably just going to go to the last page and see what the fee is that you've that you've offered. Right. So you want to be there in person to walk them through and say, 
you know, hey, we're really excited about this possibility of working with you. Um, I know that you mentioned that you were really that you're really struggling now with having a home that's too small. This is really similar to you know what we did for the Jefferson family um, a couple of years ago. You know they came to us with a small house, and you can see that we were really able to give them exactly what they wanted. You know, so you're flipping through the pages, reinforcing the things that they've told you along the way, and then getting into the end when you've already explained so much of that value. Um, and when you're presenting that fee, you're also doing it in the fashion of like, this isn't this isn't a fee, this isn't a cost, this is an investment. And you're mm -hmm. going to see a return on that investment, whether that's, you know, if you're speaking with a developer, that's probably you're talking about monetary investments uh, or monetary returns on their investments, right? Um, you can also do that with homeowners too, right? They're going to have equity at the end of it. I personally would never just present the fee, would never just present the cost um, without actually showing them obviously the the value that they're getting on the other side whether that's the mental roi of you know having freedom things like that or whether that's the monetary roi where they're going to have more equity than the cost of than the cost of doing the project so, so, so what, what you're saying actually is that part of the importance here with presenting your fee is actually the context with which it's presented as opposed to just the number by itself hugely hugely and that's you know there's different ways of doing that fee it doesn't have to be a single fee right i'm sure we're or a few few years into this now but you know obviously a huge fan of doing multiple multiple fee options you know you have low tier and high tier and a middle tier um mm -hmm. doing something like that but even when you the way you're talking about it so there's actually there's a cognitive bias right that we're all very familiar with it's called anchoring bias which is a good one to keep in mind whenever you're talking about money with clients and anchoring bias is basically this idea that our expectations are very heavily set by whatever number we see or hear um, first. So a really good example of this is you walk into a retail store, for example, and either all of the clothes, you know, there's this big sale going on, right? So all of the clothes, they kept the tag on for what the original price is. It's a $200 coat, but right now you can get it for $50. So you think, oh my gosh, I'm saving $150 rather than you don't think I'm spending $50. You think I'm saving $150. Mm -hmm. um, so we see these things happen all the time. Likewise, in a retail store, they usually, if you notice, they actually tend to put expensive things at the front of the store and they put lower price things at the back of the store so that you walk in up front, you see, oh my gosh, a $3,000 couch. There's no way I'm going to buy that. And you get to the back and you're like, oh, well, $1,500 doesn't seem as bad. That seems reasonable. Right. So it's it's setting that anchor. So that's a really important thing to remember when you're talking to your clients, not to not to like trick them. This isn't a mind trick, but this is mm -hmm. just to help anchor the actual cost. So, for example, an architectural fee is small in comparison to the actual cost of construction. Right. So you're saying things like, yeah, so, you know, we anticipate that this home the cost the cost of construction this home is probably going to be about 1.5 million dollars and our fee you know associated with that is 300,000 so they hear 1.5 million first that's the anchor they're going to hear that number they're like oh my gosh that's really big and then all of a sudden 300,000 doesn't seem so big but if you were to just say yeah so our fee is 300,000 that's the only number they hear they don't have any reference to it they don't really understand its context right got it so it's literally what kind of create contrast if you like mm -hmm. in terms of well, and 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 a, and, a, and a deliberate bias so that the not so that, yeah the context is it's just the context yeah it's, yeah very interesting like, that's a it's a it's a learning thing right they don't mm -hmm. they usually and don't I, know right it's, and, I, and, I, and, I, and i guess one of the vulnerabilities then if you were sending proposals out just by emails or in the post that the other context would be somebody else's proposal right right exactly that's the only other context is is what's what are these other proposals what what are their bottom line numbers that's usually again how a decision is made yeah and this is what these rfq processes are, are end up doing and it just sort of yeah. undermines the value of it erodes the way the value of the architect and it bec we become a commodity <laughs> yeah yeah very quickly so, so, so in terms of kind of raising fees then mm -hmm. and getting, you know, really being able to get the, the premium cream of the crop, what would you suggest there? Do these sorts of strategies work in terms of being able just to raise the general level of fees? Um, how, do, how do architects go about doing that? 
Yeah, I think the short answer to that is yes. All, all of these things together, because all of these things together have a huge contribution on your ability to raise fees. Don't, I mean, I wouldn't recommend just arbitrarily raising fees because that's probably right. not going to work very well for you. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're hearing, I mean, I post about this all the time. I always encourage architects to raise their fees, which is true. I do want you to raise your fees, but if you just decide one day to double your fee, it's probably not going to be super successful, right? Mm-hmm. So when you're raising your fees, you also have to upskill yourself. And by that, I don't mean like you need to offer more services as an architect. I mean, you could do that if you wanted to, but I really mean you have to understand how to better communicate your value to your prospective clients. Because the value that you're that you're giving your clients is probably the same now as it would be if your fee was double, right? Mm-hmm. It's the same value. It's just that you might not have had, you might not have taken time yet to understand how powerful that value is, um, and to learn how to best communicate it, right? So that's one thing. So understanding all of these things, which is again through this idea of diving deeper, really, really understanding the pains and the challenges of the client before, so that you can continue to reinforce yourself and your firm as the vehicle to getting them to where they want to be. Um, obviously differentiation is another one. Now, every firm, you know, believes that they're different than every other firm, which is great, but you really have to know what that differentiation is. Um, is it, is it design? Um, that's a, that's a really hard one to do because every architecture firm wants to be differentiated by design. Well, yeah. So, th- so this is really interesting actually, because, you know, often we think that the differentiator is design and I've got to admit, you know, I've been in and architects in the industry for the last 25 years or so. And I struggle to see the difference between design Mm -hmm. in terms of, and I've got a very refined eye. So that's not it. It's, it's a hard one to go off of, right? There's firms that, that are able, I mean, there's very few firms in my opinion that are able to do it based on design. So -hmm. then you have to start thinking about it. And again, the design component, the problem with that is that, the vast, like the, as we all know, um, the majority of our clients only care so much about design. So it's hard mm-hmm. for that. It's it's hard for that to be a differentiator. So it could be things like you know your ability to maintain budget or stay on time, or you have a specific you know you specialize in sustainable design. Um, you know it's it's what it's what that it's basically, you know, it's what the thing is when you ask your clients at the end of the day, what did you enjoy most about working with us? Why did you choose us in the first place? If you ask enough of your clients that you might begin to understand, um, oh, it's because you, you were so detail oriented, right? So really understanding whatever that differentiator is, you have to understand that. The second thing you have to understand is who your ideal client is. You have to be able to identify it. You can't do everything for everyone. Um, it's going to make it like it's just going to make it impossible for you to increase your fees. Um, and the third thing to understand is what what is the outcome? What is the product that you're producing, right? And you take those together, and that's yep. the thing that you're constantly saying, you know, on your website or to your clients is we help growing families design um, sustainable homes without going over budget. Those are the three mm-hmm. things, right? A, B, and C. Or we help startups. Um, create modern office spaces in less than six months. You know, you you really nail down a specific niche. This isn't the only way, but like, even if you're even if you're doing it in different sectors, you should have a statement like that for every sector, um, so that you're really so that when someone so that when your ideal client comes to you or comes to your website, they're like, wow, this is this is me. This has to be for me. Um, yeah. So this it's almost, exactly it's almost like for. it's almost like in terms of marketing or positioning that you're taking the the conversation that you were just describing and kind of pulling out what some of those problems are and using those as here's what we do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, you're using that on the marketing component, you're using that in the conversations. Um mm-hmm. and those and that's giving you that separation, right? So it's not a race to the bottom. We're not trying to be the quote unquote fairest price. We're not trying to be the most competitive price. No, I don't want to, this not even, it's not even a competition, Ryan. It's not even a competition, right? Because we are the only ones that do what you say you need to do. We're the only yeah. ones that can do this for you. This is our specialty. This is what we do. You can charge whatever you want. 
So, so, so how do we go about then identifying like a useful niche or niche, depending how you want to say that word? <laughs> now, cause, because it, it's interesting. I've come across practices in the past who have got, who have got a serious specialism, but it's mm. just bizarre. Right. And, and so sometimes we might have, you know, we special, and I'm yeah. being silly here and over exaggerating <laughs> the, the reality of it. But, you know, what well, one, actually, this is not, this is not a silly one. This is actually someone who was genuinely, you know, their, their specialism was liminal spaces, for example. Okay. okay. Or, th- or threshold spaces. And you're like, hey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? yeah. I, 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 I get it from like perhaps an academic standpoint. Yeah, but but that but there's a, so there's a difference between that as a niche, yeah, versus what you were just describing as as a niche in in terms of helping startups. How do we like how what what makes a good niche then? How do I we identify one? I think there's a few components of it. Just thinking through it, I mean, one is making sure. So right, pe- there there might be architects that are listening to this now and being like, well, I'm not like my end goal is not as much profit as possible, right? It's not as much revenue as possible. And that's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be. So I'm not saying you should optimize all of your firm operations and all of your decisions and all of your sales processes just so that you can increase profit, increase revenue and continue growing like a, like, you know, a madman or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So it really depends on what your motivations are, right? So I would say, Hey, let's increase your revenue and increase your profit so that you can increase the salaries across your team, offer better benefits, reduce burnout, um, increase retention, you know, do like really bring the industry up, but understanding what those motivations are, right? So you want to make sure that you're going to be getting into a a niche that you're actually interested in, because if you're not, it's not going to last very long, right? Um, And you're going to want to make sure that it's a niche that has some kind of, some kind of client pool, right? And there's, there's, you know, the ways of doing that can, can vary, because it depends, it can depend on locale or region. It can it can depend on the specific types of work that you're around. That's why I was saying before, like you could just be a residential firm. That's okay. Mm-hmm. You can be like a normal residential firm, but you do have to define like that. Your niche could be I specifically work with growing families. Um, so then you're already, you know, you're already kind of narrowing down who it is that you specifically work with, and I specifically work with growing families that are focused on sustainability, right? So there's, so it doesn't have to be, you know, I do thresholds, we design thresholds, or, you know, we design ex- exhibits for these three types of artists or something like that. Like, that's too small, you can start, big. you can start general, hey, we're residential, okay, but what type of client do we want to work with? What type of work do we do? What do we b- do better than anyone else? Yeah. So, um, I think that's 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 very useful. One thing that I'll often hear from clients or architects um, will be the reluctance to want to specialize yeah. in a niche because yeah. well, that's we're an architect. We design the door handles and the chairs, and we do master planning of cities, and we build houses, and we build you know large scale housing, and we do airports. And how do we get and and, and, I, and I and there is a lot of value in being able to you know from an academic or intellectual perspective yeah you know working on it and it's fun it's yep. fun it's fun it's fun as a designer to be able to work and on, a, on a, a vast array of different projects and there's also you know depending on what the sectors are there's strength in having a diverse portfolio of work how do we combine the idea of niche with diversity of work or you know the kind of the broad ability of an architect to be able to work at different things at different scales. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. With what you define yourself as in a marketing perspective doesn't necessarily have to be the types of projects that you bring on, right? So there's kind of two answers to your question. The first mm-hmm. one is what I just said. Just because you say we work with, uh, you know, we help growing families create sustainable homes. Um, without going over budget. Just because that's what your statement is doesn't mean that if you get a, that that if you get a two, like a, you know, a retired couple that comes to you that doesn't want to do a a sustainable home 
um, that you can't take them on, right? So it just gives you additional flexibility. It also doesn't mean that you might not get a local business that's looking, you know, a local coffee shop that's looking to renovate their their coffee space to reach out to you. There's no, you know, it's it doesn't keep people from reaching out to you necessarily, uh, which is usually the concern, right? They're like, oh, well, they only do residential properties, so they might not do that. Again, we're talking that the vast majority of clients haven't worked with an architect before, right? Mm-hmm. So that's thing one. Um, the second part of that, again, is just having that statement for each sector, right? right. Just just having a really defined area of what it is that you work with. Um, so you can have multiple areas. You just really have to define what the ICP of each sector is. Um, and again, the reason to do that is so that you can really offer the highest value and the highest fee because you're so, you're kind of solving that specific problem, and those specific challenges. Got it. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. I think that's the a, a perfect place to, to, to conclude the conversation. There might be a little bit actually here in, in this kind of a more broader um, conversation actually of well, why do you think we have these kind of struggles in architecture? I'm sure we're not the only profession to, <laughs> to experience it. No, no, we're definitely, we're definitely not um, the only ones that challenges. I mean, there's this endless, there's this endless gap, right, between education and practice. It doesn't only happen mm-hmm. in architecture, um, but I think it is a very strong gap that we've probably all experienced in, in some way, shape, or form. Um, so, Even at Princeton, <laughs> <laughs> Princeton's amazing um, for for you know for a little bit of everything. Um, actually, Princeton had a really, I had a really amazing. Um, professional practice professor there, um, Bob Hillier. So shout out to shout out to Bob Hillier there. But um, you know he ran one of the largest firms in in the world at one time. Oh wow! And so it was really remarkable to have him as a professor mm. um, at the time there. But when you actually break down the amount of time that or the amount of energy and in, in learning that goes into um, your architectural education, how much of that is devoted to professional practice? Um, it's between one and three percent. Is you're typically taking one to two classes over a phase of five to eight years, um, mm-hmm. right? To uh, th- th- those are the only requirements. So you're walking out, and usually, you know, as it is in most schools, it's not the it's not the most difficult course. It's not the course that people are most excited about, you know, taking. Um, it's kind of like the it's it's just a course that doesn't bring much joy most of the time, right? This is what yeah. this is what I've experienced um so you know you you're graduating people in that have spent one to three percent of their education learning how to actually run a business and so i think out of that i mean what you know what's the best hope out of that we're almost we're almost experiencing like the best possible outcome that you could get now you know like this i don't you know i don't know i don't know how much more we could hope for um, when, when you're just doing that on, a, on an endless basis, mm-hmm. now, obviously you can, you learn in person, right? You're going to, you're going to go to a firm. If you're actually interested in these concepts, you know, you're going to talk to the principal so that you can become more exposed to these things. The challenge though, is that there's no guarantee because you're the owner or the principal went through the same education system that you did. There's no guarantee that they're in, you know, a solid state to be able to offer, you know, sound advice in, in that, in that area as well. Yeah. Yeah. So no, it's abs- kind of endless. Ab- absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it, it it is. It's a you know. There's a lot of cultural things here from and this and as you say, the gap between education and practice. And again, you know, this opens up another conversation of architecture as an intellectual discipline and a subject right. in and of its right. own right, and learning and mastering it in its in and of its own own right, like a mathematician might learn maths and pure mathematics yeah. and yet we don't know yeah. what the, the net the actual application of that stuff is and it might yeah. have all sorts of applications but being and, being a professional architect in the construction industry building yeah. buildings is is very very different it's very very it is different, different. And, and to be honest with you i almost don't have you know i think i do think that that college education university it should be an opportunity for you to explore different modes of thinking different ways of doing things like that should absolutely happen it shouldn't i'm i'm definitely don't believe it should be entirely practical um Mm -hmm. but it's i think it's the primary thing are these myths that we kind of learn along the way like those to me are actually a little bit more detrimental 
to the overall like course of the industry than only spending one to three percent you know of your education in professional practice like the other parts that are really hard is reinforcing this culture of overworking of getting burnt mm -hmm. out of working long hours like that's heavily reinforced in education you're reinforcing this idea that um your time uh is not valued typically right because you might be working for free for professors or going to work you know for a very small amount working on specific things so you know you're told that you're told that you shouldn't be in architecture if you want to make a lot of money right so you're told right from the beginning that there's not there's not a whole lot of benefit there so you're already kind of giving up on that idea you're generally told that money is you're kind of like if not directly told you're indirectly kind of taught that money isn't good it's not the thing that we should be chasing um mm -hmm. you shouldn't be like this isn't about profit this is about design this is about sustainability and things like that so you're really reinforcing poor business and cultural practices on a daily basis. And to me, that's much more detrimental than just, you know, only taking one professional practice course. I, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you there. It's the, it's the, it's the what's not included and it's the kind of poor culture that we end up inadvertently adopting because we're not talking about money and we're not talking about the financial context of how design actually, you know, the relationship between d design and finance is just left as a blank you figure it, it out when you're in you're in practice and then yeah there's almost this kind of uh like a little bit of a a, a kind of i don't want to use the word cult but i, I the word cult <laughs> comes to mind but i was talking to a business consultant a while ago and who worked with a lot of architects they weren't an architect themselves and i and mm -hmm. i asked them what's it like working with architects and they're like he was like well you know what it's a bit like you guys have joined a cult and everyone's really <laughs> obsessed with this, with the design. And you like, you make these kind of crazy sacrifices in your business to make sure that there's design and it doesn't matter. They go quite against um, business sense. And I think that's something that we just need to be responsible for of the, the cult of design, if you like, and that yeah. we prize it so highly. And as you said earlier, it's not always the thing that our clients prize. Mm -hmm. oh, and, almost never. Yeah. It almost never is, but yeah. And, and, and we need to be able to inquire and question some of the, you know, well, like, who is the design for ultimately? Like, where is it? Where is it powerful and empowering? Where is it actually, um, you know, actually detrimental to, to, you know, in, in, you know, and again, we've got to be able to look at this with, with a level of discrimination and, and, yeah. and nuance and individual situations, but where are we making enormous sacrifices to have design, which has perhaps not been asked for or is not being appreciated or is not understood or is not even really appropriate mm -hmm. in this situation. And that's at the cost of uh, my team's salary and yeah. their, <laughs> their, their lifestyle and them working these crazy hours because yep. they're fulfilling on on an arc, on an, on an artistic whim if yeah. you like yeah yeah and and you know that you're exactly right and the the challenge with that is that it's tough as a student to recognize it right i mean i loved architecture school i loved mm. undergrad i loved grad school i loved you know working in the studio and working on these projects like you know everyone gets into their own kind of flow state doing mm -hmm. that thing um, and working on those projects, which is awesome. The, the problem is that you walk away and you realize, oh, so I don't just get to, you know, kind of imagine my own project here. Um, the boundaries aren't as flexible anymore. Uh, I do have to get paid for this type of work and, and you know, create a kind of sustainable living for myself. So it's, you, it's generally, you know, it's a slow realization that we all might have after we graduate. Because when we're in it, we do, I mean, at least most of the people that I know and most of the friends that I have in architecture, you know, we all enjoyed it in some capacity. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm very much the same. Th thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the intellectual rigor of it. Yeah. And the kind of curiosity of it. Um, and then kind of fell off a big chasm when you enter into profession and like, whoa, <laughs> hold on a minute. What was I sold here? This was something totally different. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, Tyler, that was absolutely fascinating and you know really really appreciate you taking the time here to share your expertise and um your your knowledge base here so thank you so much yeah thank you ryan it was a it was amazing we went on a fun journey there all the way all the way around the the map of the business of architecture so i'm very excited yeah thank you so much
And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.